It's great to see such a packed room today. I'm super excited about this topic and being able to share uh, more information about how to use evidence-based approaches to both internships but also uh, workforce in a, in a larger, an, along a larger continuum. Uh, so I am just going to introduce our, our speakers today. We did set up, instead of a traditional panel sort of approach, we did decide to have more of a, a conversational approach to this session. So uh, Martin's going to talk a little bit about his organization and the work he's doing. And then uh, we're going to have a conversation between him and Jason, who uh, represents a manufacturing, uh, a portfolio of manufacturing companies. So. Let me move forward with the introductions, and uh, then we'll jump in, and we'll have some time uh, at the end of the session for, excuse me, questions. Uh, so over to the far left, well, I guess you're right, my left, Jason Drake. Uh, Jason joined the Dante Moore Company, uh, a Cleveland-based portfolio of small to mid-sized manufacturing companies uh, in 2014, and he serves as the Director of Education and Workforce Development. Uh, in this role, he works hands-on with the, the Dante Moore leadership to build pipelines of manufacturing workers and develop incumbent worker training programs. In addition, because as if that's not enough, uh, Jason is also the co-founder and executive director of the Workroom Program Alliance, a 501c3 uh, that is specializing in delivering education and training to underserved uh, students within the Cleveland area. Uh, I'm going to tell you he has a PhD, which, wow, and uh, spent 10 years teaching at uh, NYU, and we're thrilled to have him back in Northeast Ohio. Uh, most interestingly, perhaps, Jason grows orchids and knows enough about chickens to tell me that I shouldn't have any. Uh, Martin Scaglione is the CEO of the Hope Street Group, and Martin has really made it his life's work to create access to learning and opportunities for those in need. Uh, his most recent roles include uh, the co-founder and uh, CEO of Veritas Learning, a talent technology company, uh, and president and COO of ACT's Workforce Development Division, uh, where he actually launched the National Career Readiness System and helped drive President's Ob President Obama's Job Council's Right Skills Now program. Uh, previously, Martin served as, served as the COO of Bosch Siemens Household, VP of Corporate Strategy at Han Industries, and Vice President of Marketing at Maytag. So he really has that strong manufacturing background, and it's great to have folks in workforce who actually come from uh, the business side. Uh, Mar uh, Martin lives in New York with his wife, so we're, we're happy to have him in Northeast Ohio for today at least. And my little tidbit on him is that he has a 15-month-old granddaughter, and so you know I'm hopeful that his work, the work that you're doing, is really going to make the world of work more, access more accessible to her down the road. So with that, I'll turn it over to Martin to get us started. Thank you. Do we have a, a control to advance the slides? I'm sure we have one somewhere. Yeah, was, didn't even realize that. Oh, right here. But there it is, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. All right. I am going to stand up, Jason, if that's okay, so I don't block the screen. Uh, because the slides that you're going to see are so powerful that I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That that's the first slide I want to kick us off with, and I'm going to make sure people can hear. Um, we think in America there's a signaling problem. Have you heard that before? Signaling has, has that come across your radar at all? It's the idea that. On one hand, the communication between the interested stakeholders in workforce, they're not working well. We actually think it's deeper than that. So a little bit about Hope Street Group and what we do. We were started on Hope Street in Los Angeles, California by McKinsey, uh, you know, the great consulting firm. So we were spawned by that organization. There was a group of leaders there, well, as well as some leaders that were part of their network, that felt that our political system was not working well. This goes back to the early you know, 2000, 2001, that legislation and policy was not really advancing in a way that would be creating economic opportunity in our country. I, I do have to pause and ask, you know, how well are we doing today by comparison to 15 years ago? So the, the experiment of Hope Street Group, um, going back to that time, 
it continues as not just an experiment, but more as a social enterprise that's designed to try and get at root cause problems that are ailing our big systems like workforce and education. So part of the work when I joined the firm uh, as the CEO four years ago was to dig underneath the workforce system and understand what really is ailing the workforce system and preventing individuals from finding the opportunity that we think all Americans deserve here in America. And we termed it the signaling issue. And it was more than just communication. It was really about an individual progressing towards a place of prosperity and finding barrier after barrier after barrier. Some of those were intentional, yes, but for the most part they're not. It was that the, the fact that there was not access to the information that was necessary for people to meet their full potential. So I ask you this question of, that we ask often when we do our surveys and our research, do you know what you need to know to meet your full potential? It's very obvious from the Gallup research, if you were to triangulate that data to that question, that people are in need of coaching. They are in need of intermediaries primarily because they don't know. And so they rely on a third party to help inform. An optimal system would say we don't need that third party. An optimal system would say that are very clear and transparent and I clearly have what I need to understand what's going to be available and where I can access that information so that I can find that opportunity that meets my full potential. So I can have the job that I want. So that's what that's about, the whole signaling chart, that infographic. And if we think about how that might work in a better way, is really what the effort is, is, is about. Can employers signal in a more profound, precise way what's necessary to be successful in an occupation? Can an educator use that information to help articulate the training and the preparation that's necessary for a specific occupation? Ultimately, can an individual navigate because there's a clear and transparent system? So it's aspirational on one hand, and it creates what we believe now today is a movement across the country to improve the signaling. The troika of the individual, those who prepare, and the employer is very, very messy. Uh, we heard from Art this morning speak about what they're doing with internships. That's a method, right? We heard Dr. Berkman speak about method. And they're going to be very different methods across the country, but if we can improve the signaling, and the analog that we use is the blood marker of the job. If we can get to the level of detail around the occupation, it will help inform the system a lot better. And by the way, that information is available. So a little bit more about what we've done. I'm sorry that slide did not come out well. Is we've created field practice. And one of the field practices is in healthcare. In order to experiment with this idea of signaling in a more scientific way, you've got to create fields of practice. And what we've done is tried to create fields of practice with employers who are leading in the healthcare space by establishing what are the necessary requirements for success in a particular job. So we have seven markets set up across the country where this test is underway. It's been underway for about 18 months. It was originally sponsored by the White House. And the idea was that if employers can lead a competency-based methodology for career pathways, and by leading it means providing the field practice, helping with the coalescing of the individual stakeholders that might be a participant in that practice, we could in fact change the landscape of what the workforce would look like, but also how the workforce would operate inside of healthcare settings. So across the country today, there are seven markets. There are two in New York, Bronx and the Queens. Uh, Fairview Health is the employer that's leading the Minneapolis initiative. In West Michigan, it's the Trinity Healthcare System. In Sacramento, there's a coalition of hospitals, Dignity, Kaiser, UC Davis, and others. Same thing is true in Denver. And in the Carolinas, in particular in Charlotte, the largest public health care system, Atrium Health, formerly Carolinas Healthcare System, is leading that effort. And so far, we've seen very positive results. And I'll give you an example of what those results are in just a moment. Um, what we're also seeing, I'll back up, is a organization called CareerStat, which has a network of healthcare providers 
that have now joined this network to try and bring the learnings and the findings of each of the efforts forward in a very comprehensive way. But here are the results, and then Jason and I are going to get into a little bit of a Q&A commentary on this. In West Michigan, they, like every market, have identified that there is a need for talent. And that talent just isn't in healthcare. In the case of Trinity, their interest was in healthcare. But across America, what we're seeing is this huge demand for talent. There's, if you look at the JOLTS data, the BLS data nationally, we see a trend upward every month or every quarter when that's released. Uh, a million plus open jobs in healthcare across America and growing. You know, what are you going to do about that? And those jobs range any, anywhere from the allied health professions all the way up to the clinicians. Um, so what Trinity did is address that problem locally. They started using a system in the chart number two, which you look at, which is about how to build a funnel and how to build the talent. But I want to really move to the results so we can get into our conversation. And the results are staggering. When a evidence-based method, meaning using the Markers of a job are used as the outcome measure that you're seeking for a pathway, pro, uh, pathway model. When you build talent to the specifics of the occupation, it's astonishing what can happen. In the case of Trinity, in the case of Fairview, in the case of the Carolinas that I described earlier, they are seeing retention of the employers, employees excuse me, at a time when there's a huge demand for talent increasing. In other words, turnover is in decline. What they're also seeing is employee engagement at an all-time high. Why? Because the individual employee now is using the skills that they've been trained to, and they're deeply engaged because their productivity is higher. It exactly triangulates to what Scott was speaking about with his Gallup research. And what I think is the most interesting is diversity. West Michigan is a classic example whereby their non-white population in West Michigan is about 17%, yet Mercy Health in West Michigan is hiring and retaining help approaching 35% in skilled professional roles at the highest levels of engagement ever in the history of the company. Now what that's meant for that organization is they're returning to their bottom line, their ROI, significant profitability. So much so that the goal now is to roll out this particular practice throughout the entire Trinity Health System. So the question that I pose to this group and what we're going to discuss now is can this work in other industries? Can this method work in other industry industries? Can we deploy that and what would it what would be necessary in order to make that happen? So I'll close with those opening comments. And um, I don't know what slide I want to leave up. I, I think I want to leave that last slide up, even though my head will be blocking a portion of it, because I think we're going to come back to this in part of our dialogue. OK. Yeah, so great. thank you. So um, just to start out, you know, we're, I think the manufacturing sector is in similar straits that the healthcare sector was in, the million jobs openings that you just mentioned. I think Deloitte did a study in 2014 and estimating somewhere between two and three million jobs will be available in manufacturing uh, real soon. Um, the average age of a machinist is something like 57 years old. Um, so we've got a huge amount of institutional wisdom about to, to walk. Um, so, you know, why do you think this work, uh, you know, getting back to the question that you just posed, or maybe how could this work best be replicated in an industry like manufacturing that, that has some, some real differences from, from the healthcare system? Yeah. yeah. First, I think it's important that we recognize the difference between the healthcare practice, if you will, and manufacturing. Um, they both involve people for certain. Well, thank you. Little hard to hear. Oh, Is it? Okay, yeah. sorry. Thank you. Yeah, they both involve people. Um, and they both produce you know, some type of outcome. One of the things we discovered in our work and con the comparisons between the two industries is that healthcare providers, institutions, the hospitals locally, they feel like there is a social obligation to be providing for you know, the citizenship a service, you know, much like a public service, streets, roads, schools, systems, et cetera, the healthcare. So there's, a, there's this 
deep commitment to the community. Whereas in manufacturing, as committed as a manufacturer may be, um, their primary customer, if you will, is those who buy their products. And so it takes a little bit of a different mindset shift. Um, the, other, the other key difference between the two industries is that hospitals pretty much look the same. Other than the size of the hallways, you know, the height, the, 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 the width of the hallways, they're all using the same equipment. And they're all pretty much in compliance with the, what are regulations and standards. Whereas in manufacturing, it's very different in that regard. Uh, there's, there's a culture inside of every one of the manufacturers. Their machines may be calibrated different. I know, I worked, you know, as you do, worked in manufacturing. I worked in manufacturing for 25 plus years, and we thought, oh my goodness, what we're producing and what we're providing and our machines and our equipment and our process and so forth is just superior than to our competitor or to, in the industry. And in some cases, there may be some truth to that. So the result of that is, is that the, the standardization of people or the standardization of how we train and prepare people is somewhat different. But that said, understanding what's necessary for success in a job is the exact same process. The requirements of a position can be clearly defined, whether it be a medical assistant or a machinist or a CNA or a welder. I'm not saying those two jobs are the same, but you can actually get to the DNA of each one of those occupations, which then enables you, when you're moving through this pathway model, to get very specific about what job one, job two, job three might look like and what a progression or an opportunity might look like for someone inside of a career. So knowing where I'm going to land and where I'm going to go next, not only is the job title, but also what's required underneath to find success. So that would be the commonality. Right. So you're pointing to, to the skills uh, required for that job, and which, which gets us into, into competencies, and, and what exactly a competency-based model is. I mean, I think we all have varying definitions about what comp competency-based means. So, um, but, but in your, in your methodology, you do make a clear distinction between foundational and occupational uh, competencies. So what, what's the difference between those two, and, and why is the dis distinction so important to workforce initiatives? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So as, as Rebecca mentioned, I was the president and chief operating officer at ACT, and we spent a lot of time on measurement and um, creating instruments, if you will, that would measure the likelihood of someone's success in a particular outcome. You know, as an example, the ACT is designed to measure whether or not a student will be successful, successful being getting a C or greater, in credit-bearing courses in the first year of college. That's the real design of that. We tried to make it much more than that. We tell people it was more than that, but the reality, that is the exact calibration. So when we speak about foundational skills versus industry-wide skills or technical skills, you kind of think of it as a layering, if you will. The foundational skills are cognitive abilities, behavioral abilities, and physical abilities. So can I come to work and be able to do the level of applied reading, applied math, locating, observation, etc.? Those would be the cognitive abilities that are required for that specific job. And we can't assume that people actually have those foundational cognitive abilities. So you know, I'm, I'm not here to advocate that everybody should be tested, but I, what I am suggesting is that some form of measurement to understand what that individual needs to know at that cognitive level is, is absolutely critical, especially at the foundational level, because they can build and stack from there. The industry-wide would say in manufacturing that I have broad-based acumen about the, the, the industry of manufacturing, about the facilities, how they work, what they produce, and then the technical skills would say within a particular environment, I know how to operate a machine. Or if I'm a welder, I know how to lay a bead and I know how to read the blueprint. Or if I'm an advanced maintenance technician, I understand how machines operate, and more importantly, I know how to fix them as well. And every component part, whether it be HVAC, electrical, pneumatics, hydraulics, etc. And oftentimes, when we see credentials come that signify that someone has the technical skills, built inside of that, it's implied that they actually may have the 
foundational character skills, which are also called soft skills. We hear about that. And that all isn't always the case. So understanding the linkage between all three of those layers and the component parts inside really links back then to the DNA of the job. So we think that all three of those are critical, and it's very possible to get to that level of specificity in a job. So when we're talking about competencies, and, and you touched on it a little bit in your, in your comment right there, uh, there's no shortage of assessment tools out there. Um, some work, we know, some we're not sure about, but, but measuring work readiness, um, what, what do you look for in an assessment tool when, when we're getting into that gray area of work readiness? Yes, yeah, I, I think it's important to know what we're measuring or what outcome we're seeking through the measurement. So if you understand that first, then you can select a tool. If I am trying to measure the distance between the wall to my left and the wall to my right, I can step it out with my feet. I wear a size 11 shoe and I can probably get to some level of estimation of what that is. And if I do it frequently enough, I could probably look and say, well, the distance between the left and the right, eh, it looks like it's about 40 feet to me based on the tiles that are on the floor, which are probably eight inches across. I could count those as well. If I really want accuracy, I might get a tape measure. Right? So it all depends what you're trying to do and the level of calibration that you're seeking. Um, so when I think about the assessments that are out there today, there's a gentleman in the crowd this morning asked about the National Career Readiness Certificate. He asked uh, Art about that. He asked about work keys and so forth. Obviously, that was an ACT product. We think it was an excellent measurement. The, the gap there, and having run that business division, was that it was primarily a measure of cognitive abilities. There was not this, the, the social ability, self abilities, or the behavioral side of that. So it made the test incomplete if you wanted a whole measure of the person. So what do you do to backfill for that? But I have to pause then and ask, well, how would folks who are in the space of trying to make sourcing uh, decisions, development decisions, how would they know about all of that? Right there, there again, comes to the mass confusion about, you know, is my tool better than your tool? And is ETS better than ACT? Is Pearson better than Hogan? And all the different assessments that are out there. Start with what the outcome is first that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. And then look and rely on someone who has knowledge to help you calibrate the best instrument. We believe strongly that measurement along these pathways is absolutely essential. Can it be done through other tools other than an assessment? It can be as well, right? Structured interviews, you know, through professional guidance, etc. Yep. Just try to be wary of yes. the time here. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have much time, and we want to make sure that there's time for, uh, for questions uh, from the audience too by, by the end here. Um, so in a report that the Hope Street Group uh, put out with Alcoa Foundation, um, it's called Making Makers, um, which is available on your website, by the way. Uh, you say that good data starts with professional job analysis, and I think we've been kind of circling around this a little bit in our conversation so far. So what, what is professional job analysis, and, and why is it so important to, to the whole project of developing talent pipelines? I'm going to answer that first by asking, are there any I.O. psychologists in the room? Uh, PhD I.O. psychologists in the room? Yes? No? Masters. masters. Oh, I guess they have to be a PhD. Is there a master's? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just wanted to know, you know, yeah, so, so uh, I'm relieved that there's not a lot because they know more about this than I do. But, you know, in general terms and then even to a layer of specificity, if you really want to get to the detail of the job, you should be doing a job profile. Theoretically, you should be doing that. It gives you a task analysis. It assigns what abilities are necessary to be able to do that. So it's the alignment of what's necessary at the job versus what the individual skill may be, exist, or how you might develop that skill so that you can get that tight calibration. So we think while that is important, what we've learned, and we learned this from my experience at ACT and through this field practice that I'm describing, is that there is a method that one can do that not necessarily is a workaround of the task analysis, but actually utilizes the data that exists today to do a confirmatory process around that so it is less onerous on the employer to do that task analysis and significantly less money than what a traditional profile or task analysis would entail. 
Um, and that process is simply using ONET as a baseline and then going through a confirmatory process against that database or triangulating that same data from the ONET with other taxonomies that might exist in the job process. Um, there, there is not a extreme large quantity of expertise in that field. And so what we're looking to do is be able to get that to a level of higher proficiency with more and more availability and more people being able to do that so you can help inform these pathway models. Yeah, that, that was my next question. Um, you know, Dan T. Moore is no swage lock. <laughs> um, we've got about 500 employees. Um, and though we clearly see the need to become more involved in, in building talent pipelines because all manufacturers are suffering, um, not all companies are willing or able to commit that money or man hour, those money, uh, money or man hours without some guarantee of a return on investment. Um, so how do you make the case that your method will deliver ROI even for smaller companies who, who don't have the capacity to, to dedicate this time and, and energy and money? Yeah, yeah R ROI is a tough one. In accounting terms, it's very simple, right? You know, we can look at the return based on the cost. Um, but there's also what I call social ROI, you know, inside of the communities. And I think about Cleveland and my goodness, there's 200 plus people sitting in this room today because they care about the community. And we're seeing that across all, all, all across the country. You know, I'm very blessed that I get to come across the country and see this effort. So that, yeah, I think about social ROI and I think about just simply the business perspective. I think it comes back to the whole idea of the sibling. If you can get a uniform common alignment around what is necessary for success in the job and share that data pace. And unfortunately, that's not easily done today because data protocols are different depending on how you report the data and where, where, where that data resides. If we can get to a level, and there is a movement afoot across the country to get that to a place where there is common protocol so it can be shared across, then you, a smaller organization versus a larger organization, can look at those particular positions, which are potentially very common, a machinist, a welder, whatever, wherever you're in, in the production cycle, and then do a confirmatory process at a localized basis or in a particular location basis that's very low cost, and it will stand up in terms of reliability, validity, and legal defensibility. And that is really what I think is, is frightening people today, is they don't know. And so as a result, they do what, they, what has been working for them traditionally, and they source and they bring on talent based on a degree or years of experience, as opposed to someone's ability to do a job, because it's hard to determine what that is. So I think we're going to move to some Q&A, and uh, you know, you heard in the comments, and you heard a question earlier today about uh, bachelor's degrees and, and going back and looking, and when, re when it really comes down to it, uh, people don't know why that bachelor degree is required, and I think some of uh, what Martin is describing, it gives us a way to be able to justify why that bachelor's degree is required, or more likely, uh, document skills that individuals will have, therefore opening up the talent pool. So happy to entertain questions. Hi, I'm Amy Harker from the ESC of Cuyahoga County, and I work in the K-12 environment. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to understand is um, we are not currently teaching those uh, soft skills, and we need to be intentionally doing that in K-12. And if we're doing that, we need a system that can identify and one of those systems that I'm kind of trying to work with is the badging system because it needs to be evidence-based. All those tools that you talk about are great in the end result, but what are we doing along the way to do the um, formative assessment to say they don't have it, therefore what do we need to work on in the K-12 environment to, to bring them up to speed? So if we had that kind of system where we could universally and consistently and with fidelity say that this student is getting that and this is the evidence that backs it up. How do you see that working in, in the younger environments so that we can prepare them for these kind of pathways that will get them on the road? Yeah. yeah. Amy, first of all, thank you for being in the K-12 space. We spend a lot of time, Hope Street Group does in K-12. We have a teacher fellowship program in 12 states now. And what you're describing, the question you just asked, we hear frequently. And there isn't a good answer at this point. What we think is the right answer, does, and, and I'm not saying that we're solid in this thinking, is that if you were to back map off of the end game, which is a job, 
and start to see what that might look like in the early development. Now, we get a lot of pushback on that because that sounds like tracking a student, right? It sounds like you're putting a student in a track, and we're suggesting that's not the case. What we're saying is, let's get the data for the entire picture of work. Every single job can be codified. There, there are 900 job titles, 900 occupational for, uh, uh, titles that have been established by the ONET. So let's get that to a level of detail and start to do the correlations between a retail position, a manufacturing position, a healthcare position, and understand what the future of jobs might look like as well as we see the data start to shift over time. <coughs> and then that would help inform the system that you're asking for or what you're prescribing. There is no way to do that at this point in time that I'm aware of. I think there is. I want to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have ideas. Good. Good. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Over here. Martin, in the pathway that you described, did you have, I didn't, and maybe it's on the bottom part of the slide, did you have an academic partner, like an educational institution, like a community college, that worked with the institutions as they moved folks along? We did. Actually, using West Michigan as perhaps the most developed model, Grand Rapids Community College was deeply engaged, number one. And now what's happening in West Michigan is the work is, is starting to infiltrate the evidence-based method in through the K-12 system. There's a leading high school in West Michigan, in Grand Rapids, that has looked at the system to say, I have students that are going to be going off into careers. They may be going into two-year, four-year, it doesn't matter. We've got to get them exposed, kind of back to your question. And we have to understand what it is that we need to provide for them so that better decisions can be made. And maybe perhaps this inefficiency, Judith, that's in the system today can be uh, uh, mitigated or reduced. So yes, uh, uh, in West Michigan, Grand Rapids Community College is deeply engaged. Um, I have to say that in the other markets, um, less so. L less so. And I'd like to see more of that. Um, and there always seems to be a fight between the employers and the community colleges, to be really blunt about it, is our observation. Yeah. Uh, just had a question on the outcomes based. So do you, can you give a specific example of maybe a job where, where you, were, you were doing this, looking at the outcomes, backing into the career path, and just describe what would that look like from you know, looking at a successful outcome and then you know, kind of developing that pathway together. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there might be two answers to that question. They're, they're not different, but there may be two questions inside of the question as well. I wanted to cite uh, what Toyota does in the AMT program. Are you familiar with Toyota's? Anyone familiar with Toyota's AMT, the fame, the whole kind yeah. of, it's, it's a brilliant program. And that what they've done is they've designed a very specific set of requirements for success for an AMT. And then they back map that into the preparation through a variety of technical colleges across the country where they have uh, manufacturing uh, facilities. So they're building a pipeline. They have a very specific set of requirements. And it is a long journey. But basically, the student, the learner, is employed at a manufacturer, not necessarily a Toyota plant, but a manufacturer working, earning, learning, and getting a combination of education I mean, hands-on training, classroom training, practicum inside of a, uh, a, a simulated environment, and applying that out to the work environment. Mm -hmm. It is perhaps, in my mind, the most uh, uh, sophisticated program. It has a lot of rigor, and it's probably not for every single job and for every person. All right. So I, I think, you know, from that perspective, they've created a very clear path to a very specific job. What we have said in healthcare, and we also would think this is true in manufacturing, is that using this chart, I don't know if you can see this from the back of the room, that when you source talent, you should be thinking about bringing someone into an organization for job three, even though you're bringing them into job one, and knowing what that job three is and what that stair step should be. And along the way, how then do they, meaning the individual, fulfill the developmental needs so that they can be successful in job three. 
whether that's signified through a credential, a learning that accompanies that credential, or the job experience. So, using, so that's why I say there's two answers. The Toyota model is very simple. You're going to be hired as an AMT, you're going to train as an AMT, and that's the ultimate position inside of manufacturing. And you can, may advance within the AMT discipline, but you're not going to move across from a welder to a machinist. Whereas in healthcare, we see the stair steps and we see the same thing in some manufacturing positions as well. Okay, we have time for one more question. The industry has invested heavily over the years in uh, recognized, industry recognized credentials from a national standpoint. Have those played into your thinking and strategy along these lines? We know that Ohio Department of Education has adopted many yes. uh, industry recognized credentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's a great question. There's been a mass proliferation of credentials across all industries. And the question and the challenge is what's valid, what's reliable, what is, you know, is there truth in credentials? You may be familiar that the Lumina Foundation is spending a significant amount of money to try and drive the truth in credentials. And they have funded an organization called the Credential Engine. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. And the Credential Engine is designed to create initially a registry of all credentials, what those credentials mean, how they have been established in terms of their reliability and validity. And I think it's going to ultimately be a very useful tool. So yes, we think that credentials are essential. There is a mindset amongst selection and, and development of talent that you have to have some type of marker as a demonstration. The degree has been the primary proxy. A credential could serve as that proxy as well. But we have to understand what it means. So we believe in it, but we think that having validity and truth in those credentials is absolutely essential. Okay, thank you. So we have copies of the case study that was done on the Grand Rapids work up at the table. And if you are interested in, in staying updated on the ongoing conversations with Martin and his team about Sync Our Signals, please uh, leave a card with me. We can keep you plugged in. And uh, let's give our presenters a round of applause.